Hey, namaste. Namaste. Hey guys, this is Johnny FD and Namaste. Uh, this is my presentation that I'm gonna do for the Nomad Cruise called Time Hacking Like a Boss, how to basically take over, take control of your time and actually live the four hour work week while building businesses, running businesses, and creating passive income online. As you can see, I am in Kathmandu, Nepal, so I apologize for any distractions. It's gonna be um, a bit loud here. There's a lot going on, but let's get right into it. All right, everyone, if you don't know me by now, I'm Johnny, and today I'm gonna be teaching you about time tips, tricks, and hacks on building and running businesses by time hacking like a boss. So if you do know me, it probably is from either one of my podcasts, Travel Like a Boss podcast, Invest Like a Boss podcast, my blog, johnnyft.com, or from the Nomad Summit. And I've been traveling pretty much full-time since 2007, right after I read the four-hour work week. I've been working as a digital nomad since 2013. And since then, I've been making more than $100,000 a year. And I've been to 37 plus countries and it's been really fun. So you might be thinking, okay, you're doing all this and you're running all these businesses, how do you time hack? So first off, let me go through some of the businesses that I currently run. I have a couple of dropshipping stores, uh, pretty much always. <laughs> uh, I have a couple Kindle books, uh, 12 Weeks in Thailand, as well as Life Changes Quick. I have a couple of courses on Udemy. I have a YouTube channel where I upload videos usually, you know, two, three times a month. And I have a lot of my income comes from affiliate income, which is something that I teach in my course, Income Boss, and I have the course as well. So I have all these different businesses uh, and you would expect me to have hundreds of emails, you know, a lot of customer service issues, you know, needing to fulfill orders and really mainly just having my phone go off all the time. So with you know social media all the different messages you have to reply to whether it's direct messages on instagram or on facebook or uh really just everywhere it feels like a ticking time bomb with social media overload and it's easy to get stressed out but as you can see i'm in nepal and this last month i spent 16 days trekking through the himalayas mostly without internet I also went on a three-day safari uh, where I saw rhinoceros and wild pigs and all these kind of cool animals, and I didn't have any internet there. So I'm actually living the four-hour work week. So how do you actually take back your time and be able to do these things while running all these businesses? So I want to introduce you to two stages in my life that I've been running since really 2013. I call it growth mode and maintenance mode. If you guys have a better uh, name for these, I would love to hear them. Uh, but really, this is what it is. When I'm in growth mode or building mode, this is when I'm building a new business or I'm adding a new stream of passive income. This is where I'm spending time optimizing ex existing streams to either automate it more or get more income out of them. And this is also when I automate outsource or eliminate things that I don't need to do. So really get myself out of the loop and remove myself from the business. When I'm in growth mode and I'm building a new business, I'm working 40 to even 80 hours a week sometimes. You know, when I was building my dropshipping stores, I was up at two, three, four in the morning when it was US time while I was in Thailand just to be able to catch suppliers during normal US business hours so I can get them on the phone. Sometimes I would have to wake up at six or seven in the morning so I can catch him at the end of the day. So I was working a lot building my businesses, but the goal with all my businesses has been to eventually be able to go into maintenance mode. Where maintenance mode, you're not necessarily growing the income, but the goal is to pretty much keep it going the same. Uh, so if you're making five grand a month, you wanna continue it around that, you know, that point without going up or down too much. Same thing if, if it's a bit higher. This is where you can go on vacation, you can turn off your phone, and you can just check in, you know, maybe an hour a day or every other day, and really just handle the big issues instead of handling the day-to-day -day tasks. And this is where you can actually work four hours a week, you know, maybe sometimes up to 14, maybe you're you know, working two or three hours a day sometimes, uh, maybe, you know, most days you work for an hour, and then one day a week you go into kind of growth mode again to build something or handle big issues. So. 
these are the two modes that I've been going in and out of for the last four years now. And in general, I'll spend two or three months in growth mode, and then I'll spend you know one or two months in maintenance mode. So here's some examples of the businesses I'm in. I currently have about 15 sources of passive income. Uh, some are 100% passive, like my Kindle books, my online courses, my real estate investments, peer-to-peer -peer lending, stocks, index funds, uh, all the different ways where I can create income or earn income without any work really at all after the initial work where you front load all the work, you do all the work in the beginning and then everything's kind of automated or pretty much 100% automated. Then yes, some things that are semi-passive like my podcast sponsorships, my YouTube ad revenue, my affiliate earnings from my blog or even you know my email autoresponders when people go through uh, those and end up buying something. The reason why I call those semi-passive is even though technically most of the money is made either while I'm sleeping because I'm usually in the opposite time zone. So when the US is awake, I'm normally asleep, but they're making uh, purchases then, which means I'm not you know, trading my time for money. I can go on vacation. I can uh, go travel for a week or two and have more money in my bank afterwards. However, the reason why I call it semi-passive is if I go you know, two months without uh, recording a podcast or a new video, the traffic's gonna drop. So eventually, even though I have a lot of organic SEO and a lot of evergreen content, eventually it'll start dropping a bit. So it requires you to continue creating content uh, or you know, getting more people into your email list, things like that. And then I have businesses that are outsourced uh, where I either hire it out, I have a partner, or I have it run by VAs. Uh, this includes my dropshipping stores. Uh, I've even had freelancing projects where people contacted me saying, hey, can you make me a website or make me a logo? And even though I am not a web, you know, web expert, uh, I'm not a graphic designer, but because I've been doing this for so long, I have a pretty good team or at least you know, people I know who do it and then I can manage a project. So I've created a couple websites for things like CrossFit gyms that just randomly reached out to me saying, hey, I need a website. You know, can you build one? And I said, yes. You know, I gave them a price and then I basically, you know, asked the person that I'm friends with that I use as my web developer or my graphic designer and say, hey, can you guys do this? <laughs> and I'll keep, you know, a percentage for managing the project. Uh, same thing with even just managing the conferences where it's no longer me doing the whole thing. I hire out uh, event organizers. I have video teams that do all the editing. So it's no longer you know, me doing it, uh, it's outsourced. And what's really cool, about, at least about the Nomad Summit, is it's 100% run by Nomad. So even the, the people behind the cameras, uh, you know, the people doing the editing, you know, the videographers, those are all Nomads. Uh, all the speakers are Nomads. All the attendees are Nomads. You know, pretty much everyone except for the caterers are Nomads. So that's pretty fun to do. So I want to show you what my six steps to this process is. Real quick, it's going to be build, optimize, automate, outsource, relax, and then repeat. And here is the major concepts. And don't worry about writing this down. You can always download these slides at dropshiplab.com slash timehack, all lowercase. And that way you'll have a copy of these notes uh, that you can look at and review later. So first, it's the build part. So what do I actually mean by build? This is when you actually work hard. This is when you're building that new business. And it doesn't have to be an e-commerce store. This is when you are writing a new book, you're creating a course, you are you know, basically you know, creating whatever that business is. You're um, creating a new product, you're launching something, creating a service, really whatever it is. The second part is when you optimize. This is when you scale up the business. You, you get more traffic sources. So if you're just using let's say Facebook ads in the beginning, and you want to start experimenting with Instagram ads or uh, Google ads. Or if you're using Google ads, you might want to uh, try Google POA ads and you know video ads, YouTube pre-rolls, or whatever it is. But this is also where you optimize for conversion rates. So if right now 1% of people are buying that land on your site, so one out of 100 visitors, if you can cr increase that to 1.5% or 2%, not only are you doubling your pro your actual revenue, you're actually more than doubling your profit because you're spending the same amount of money on traffic. 
This is also where you want to start creating some SEO traffic and that way you can continue to get organic visitors even when you're not actively building the business, even if your ads aren't running for whatever reason. And also, this is where I really 80-20 rule the profit. So I look at the products that are making 80% of the profit uh, and in general, it's usually going to be 20% of your total products or your total you know, services or less. And I really focus on those. So I can, I ask myself, how can I build this up? So these major things that are making the most money are going to showcase, you know, the highest and uh, be able to convert even better. And then I automate. And this is where I start paying for software or I create a script or, you know, I may pay for a service or an app to really take myself out of the business. And in automation, I also just have things like create an FAQ where it's automated because the customer or the person, you know, going to purchase instead of them contacting you or contacting your VA, they can just find the answer themselves. If you have a very clearly written description, if you have an FAQ, if you have uh, your email autoresponder set up that answers questions or you create a guide or something like that. After you automate, you want to outsource. This is when you eliminate anything that can't be automated and doesn't provide a high enough ROI for someone to you know, actually get hired for. So if you pay someone, if you have to pay someone more than you're earning from it, it's not worth it. It's something you should probably eliminate or you should figure out how to create more value so you can you know, afford to pay someone and get yourself out of the system. Now, after you've done all that, which might take a few months, this is when you wanna relax, take a break, so you can really enjoy life. Because if you've read the four hour work week, you never know what's gonna happen when we retire. We might be too old, uh, we might be unhealthy, we might die tomorrow. So really you wanna start taking mini vacations, mini uh, breaks, mini retirements even, and start enjoying life now. So you might even have a you know, mini, mini break between some of these stages, but really you need to get through all four to be able to take a full break because you want the system running uh, without you in it and still profitable before you take yourself out of it. But really, this is where you treat yourself, you follow your passions. For me, it's going scuba diving. I like going on long liverboard trips where I'm without internet for you know five, six, seven days in a row or going for long hikes. Uh, you know, like here in Nepal where I'm gone for, you know, 10, 12 days at a time. And after you do all that and you have some energy, you know, you're excited, you go back and you repeat. With the money that you've made from your business, you can either reinvest the profits into growing that business more, starting a new business, or even better, something I like to do is I like to sell the business and get, you know, normally 27 months of net profit up front for creating that business and you can take that money and invest it and have that money make you more money. So that's kind of my big secret of how I've grown my net worth so much from less than $1,000 in 2013 to close to 600,000 today. It's by just going through this process over and over with different niches, different stores, different products, uh, as well as multiple streams of income and reinvesting all of it into things that make me more money so let's talk more about what build mode is or growth mode is, because I think this is where a lot of people you know, need to add either a, a second stream of online income, uh, or maybe some of you are still working on your first. So normally I like to have a two to four month time frame. Usually I actually honestly like two or three months uh, and with a buffer if it kind of goes over. And the reason why I like two or three months is this allows you to really burn the candle at both ends and just work your butt off and not stress too much about it lasting forever or not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. You can only really work yourself so hard for so long without getting burnt out. And for me, two to three months is a good time frame. I personally also like to spend $1,000 or less on most businesses, um, usually, you know, sometimes up to $2,000. And the reason why I like to do this is I like the minimal viable product, the MVP. And if you guys don't know what that is, if you wanna know more, I actually did a whole talk about it at the 2015 Nomad Summit, I believe. You can go on our YouTube channel, look for Nomad Summit, Johnny FD MVP hacking, uh, or I have a link to it if you download these slides. Uh, but that's where I talk about what a MVP is, 
how you can basically create businesses in two to three months with a small budget and really not just with you know e-commerce store but re really with any business i even use restaurants as an example but the goal whatever business i, I get into whatever income stream i try to start my goal is to have it create another stream of income minimum of 300 dollars a month to make it worth my time uh, and hopefully you know if i can make two thousand dollars a month that means i normally make back all my money in one you know on that first month of investing two or three months in so that's a really nice way of uh, basically stacking more and more money and more income on top of whatever you are currently doing so i'm gonna give you guys an example of what i do with a dropshipping store so i normally spend two months building a site this is where i find and get approved by new suppliers i upload products and i test products using usually $500 up to $1,000 in ads to figure out what is selling. And this is where I figure out, hey, if it's not gonna work, I wanna find out real quick right now so I don't spend any more time. I can pivot into another niche. I can flip the site as kind of just a, a skeleton site or I can just get new suppliers. I can test new ads or whatever it is. This is where I wanna fail fast if needed, but also have some quick success uh, and just make sure the niche and the products works uh, before I move on to this, the next stage, which is optimizing. This is where I start spending a lot more money on ads for products and only on ones that sell. Some people ask me, how much should you budget for, for advertising once a product is selling? And the answer is as much as possible where it continues to be profitable. At some point, you're either going to run, run out of possible traffic or the ads are going to get so expensive that it doesn't create a positive return. But until you get to that point, keep putting money in because if if you're putting more money into ads and you're getting more more than that in profit, if you're spending you know a thousand dollars in ads but you're making back anything more than a thousand dollars, you know hopefully two thousand or more dollars, there's no reason why you don't continue spending more and money more money on ads. So this is where I also add additional traffic sources or at least test it. So if I just started with Google ads, I might start playing with Facebook ads or vice versa, or I might start playing with Instagram ads. And this is where I create additional traffic sources. And this is where I start building up the SEO. So I think a big problem that a lot of people have is they spend so much time building up SEO for a site or a product that may not, might not ever sell. You might not ever get a conversion. So if you can't sell it with an ad, you're probably not going to sell it with SEO. So don't waste two months of your life building up the SEO for a product and getting you know organic traffic if it's not going to sell anyways. And this is why I'm a big believer in the MVP model. This is where you also add more products. And once you have it all going up and running, this is when you want to start automating your store. So this is where you get, you know, start paying for software. So one piece of software I really like for my dropshipping stores is Aftership. It's an app where they basically take the tracking number so let's say it's a fedex or ups tracking number and they basically stock it anytime there's an update and you ups's database they go in and they pull that information and then they email it or text it to your customer so instead of the customer just getting a tracking number which they then have to go you know and plug it in themselves to see where it is they now get an automated message every time there's a status update so for example, if you ordered you know, something from one of my stores, let's say a fan, instead of you wondering where it is or you contacting my customer service to say, hey, when's it gonna be delivered? Or um, you know, I'm not gonna be home at you know, X time on this day. Can you, you know, schedule another day? And really just spending a lot of customer service hours uh, or having me have to <laughs> deal with it. With Aftership, every time there's any little tiny change, like for example, um, your ceiling fan is now on the truck going from New Jersey to New York or whatever it is, you'll get on a, you'll get an update. And you might think right now that might be annoying because you're just kind of spamming someone with 10, 20 updates sometimes. But if you are in, in that position where you ordered something and you're looking forward to it, you are really happy to get those updates. And you can always unsubscribe as well. So these are things that I really enjoy paying for because 
the cost of the automation is always less than the cost of the customer service, as well as the cost of my time. Uh, so imagine eliminating 90% of email inquiries by just simply updating people you know, before they ask. This is also where I write FAQs, I set up email autoresponders for everything possible. Uh, I, you know, I pay for other software like abandoned cart checkout so I can um, follow up on there. And I even set up my ads to autopilot where it'll spend more and more up until a point where it's not profitable. Now, once you've automated your store, this is when you want to start outsourcing. So when you outsource, you don't want to just outsource everything. First, you want to eliminate anything that can't be automated or that isn't really necessary. Once you've done that, this is where you would hire, for example, a, a VA to fulfill orders or handle customer service issues. You will hire an accountant, you know, probably from the Philippines, which is where I hired mine. And they would do all the bookkeeping, run the numbers, and make sure that we are on track. And then, very important, I like to hire US-based customers, uh, customer support, because when people call in, they generally don't like to hear an Indian or Filipino accent. People want to buy from the US. This is also a nice way to provide some jobs in the US where I've hired people who work from home, I've hired from uh, call centers or organizations, uh, but you are essentially giving someone a job and your customers are happy because they get to talk to someone with an American accent and they know, they think, you know, like, hey, this is a, a customer, you know, this is a company that's gonna take care of me because they at least care enough to hire uh, someone who I can communicate with clearly. Um, and all that gets outsourced. And if any you know big issues happen where they can't handle it, that's when it gets escalated to me and then they email me and I check it you know the next day. So this is where I can finally go relax and take the, the four hour work week schedule. I can go relax on a beach, I can go sip a coconut and take a vacation. This is where I am checking email once a day uh, and I just check it for major issues. I normally check it in the morning. That way I can respond, you know, usually by 6 p.m. California time. So at least it seems like I'm responding the same day. And optionally, sometimes I'll dedicate a full day per week adding new products or just otherwise building up the store. So even though I am in maintenance mode, you know, one day a week doesn't feel like a lot of work, um, usually because you know, I get kind of tired of laying by the pool anyways, and sometimes I actually like being in front of the computer and just chilling for a day. And this is where you can uh, still grow while you're in maintenance mode. Then most importantly, you repeat. So for what I did uh, was I took the monthly income that I would make for my stores, usually between two to $5,000 in net profit, and I would in invest that into investments. Uh, and what really, really took my portfolio, my investment portfolio from, you know, really just starting out to where it is now, it's when I sold the businesses. So I've now done this with two stores and we're working on a third one right now. And we basically flipped the store for 27 months of profit up front. And that allows me to have a big cash inf inflection. So I've made now over $100,000 just selling the stores, which I put 100% of that into investments, into the index funds on the stock market, into real estate funds, into you know hard money loans, and that is creating me more income now. So that is creating me you know, up to 10% in either interest or growth, which is another, you know, $1,000 uh, potentially, you know, in passive income, which is really, really nice. So people ask often, <laughs> you have so much happening, you know, you have so many businesses going on, how are you always so relaxed? And I'm willing to bet that whenever you see me around, I'm not really checking my phone uh, unless I'm really bored. You know, if I'm at lunch with somebody, my phone won't go off. I won't get any notifications. Uh, you know, my it's it, it's just like when I'm working, I'm working, and when I'm hanging out, I'm really relaxed. And the, one of the reasons why I can do that is I manage my smartphone, and this is what I encourage everyone to do. Use a smartphone. <laughs> use your iPhone, use your Android, because it's a wonderful tool. It's great for listening to podcasts, it's great for maps, and it's great for if you need to check something, 
you know, real quick, if you want to connect with someone, you want to keep in touch, you want to share photos on Facebook, whatever it is. What I don't recommend, it really drives me crazy, is when people go so extreme that they don't even have, you know, the Facebook app installed on their phone because they're so afraid they're going to get so many notifications that it's going to drive them nuts and they're, or they're going to get so addicted to it that they're not going to, uh, you know, be able to focus. Or even crazier is people go back to a flip phone. Don't do that. Have a normal smartphone. I always have the latest iPhone or at least the, you know, the second, gen- like the generation before because it's a wonderful tool. And all you have to do is turn off all notifications. And that means I get zero push notifications, no emails, I get no Facebook messages, I get no pings for new likes or new followers or anything like that. And on my main screen, I don't allow anything that has, you know, the little red one or five, you know, saying how many notifications you have because it's distracting. What I do is I just move those to the second or third screen and the only messages I get are going to be things that are important to me, like phone calls or text messages. And I route communications. So here is an example. So this is all the ways to contact me. If you need to contact me instantly, you can FaceTime me, uh, or you can just call me, uh, or you know, someone can WhatsApp me or iMessage me. And these are the reason why I, turn, I leave these on is because I like talking to friends, you know, I like spontaneous um, video chat. I also like when people will message me saying, Hey, you know, you hungry, you know, you want to go eat, or Hey, we're about to go watch a movie, you don't want to go, you know. And I figure anyone that has my phone number or my WhatsApp or my message is going to be a close friend, so I want to hear from them. However, if anything is not time sensitive, so someone has a question uh, about business or they want to talk about work or something that just isn't relevant you know to me right now i route that into what i call delayed communication so the easiest way to do that is just to acknowledge getting the message by replying to them on the medium that you want them to reply to and people are really easy to train this way where if you get a you know, text message or an iMessage from someone, but then you reply to them on their Facebook Messenger. Usually, they might kind of think that's weird, but they'll just they'll obviously reply to where you sent the message. So all of a sudden, you've now routed this person's messages to Facebook messages. Or if somebody emails you, you know, something business related uh, to your personal email address, just reply from your business email account. So basically. It's really hard and you know annoying to try to get people to message you the first time um, where you want them to, but it's really easy to continue the conversation and kind of train them by reply just simply replying from where you want them to reply to, and also at the time you want them to reply to. So don't reply to their <clears throat> their question about something that's not relevant to you at this moment. So. Let's say someone has a question about planning their trip to Thailand and you know it's not time sensitive, but they send it to you on WhatsApp. Instead of spending five or 10 minutes now trying to type on your phone, you know, the answer, <clears throat> just wait until the next time you're at a computer, you reply to them on iMessage and write a nice long message. So with my delayed communication, this is where I get all my Facebook messages, Twitter messages, Instagram uh, DMs, I get both my personal email and my business email, different uh, accounts. <clears throat> this is where people ask me questions that are part of my course. And really anything that needs a response, but doesn't need me to respond on my phone while I'm having dinner or where I'm out with friends. And this is where batching your work comes in. So I reply to emails just once a day. And what that actually forces me to do as well as the other person to do is to really be concise on what needs to happen. Uh, so this forces a, you know, a well thought out reply instead of a short one sentence reply where you go back and forth, back and forth. And knowing that I'm only gonna reply to, to you once a day, usually people <laughs> realize, okay, this guy's serious. I gotta actually think about what I'm gonna reply. I gotta think about every, every question I'm gonna have for the next 24 hours. So let me, you know, phrase it in a, in a way where 
all the information is there. And I do the same with messages. So with like Facebook messages or anything like that, you know, unless it's a, a friend and I happen to be at the computer and it's not a big deal to have a back and forth chat, I normally only reply to messages once a day and I try to have one long kind of well thought out message. And it's the same with like WhatsApp even. If somebody, even if it's a friend WhatsApping me, usually after the third message, I will FaceTime them. I will video call them because I figure it's easier to communicate that way. And if they can't answer, then I'll just save it and, you know, until they can. I, I really don't like going back and forth on text message all day because it's a huge drain of energy and it's a huge drain of time. And the only people that really enjoy it they're enjoying it for the wrong reasons, usually for a dopamine hit, because it's not a true connection with a friend. It's it's much better to, you know, video chat with a friend or sit down with a friend in person over coffee than it is to just, you know, send messages back and forth all day. As for content, I produce content on my schedule. So I write when I feel like writing, when I am inspired to create a video or write a blog post. And I will schedule that content to be published uh, so I have a consistent blog post coming out, consistent videos coming out. And this is where it allows you to batch your work. So one week I might record, you know, two or three podcast episodes or I might make two or three videos, but instead of releasing all of them on that same day, I will batch them out. So even when I'm on vacation, when I'm scuba diving with manta rays in the Komodo Islands, I still have content coming out and that creates passive income by because even though I did the work, I front loaded it and that's gonna make me money while I'm underwater and I'm enjoying life. And this is why it's so important to create either evergreen content, uh, which is something I teach in Income Boss or to recycle uh, used content or content in the past, either update a post or you know uh, re-engage it somehow. And that way you're not always creating new content like a you know, basically these crazy travel bloggers who feel like they need to have a new, you know, 10 new photos on their Instagram every day or they become irrelevant. So Barack Obama once said something that really resonated with me. It's don't just consume things, create things. So what does that actually mean? I actually had a, a French friend, uh, Maxence, once say this once, and he's like, you know, uh, don't, don't be a consumer, be a producer or something like that. And basically what he meant is even when it comes to content, don't just read stuff, put stuff out there. You know, if you're scrolling through Facebook or something, don't just, you know, scroll through and just consume, 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 you know, read, look at photos and maybe occasionally like something. Be part of the conversation, you know, write a thoughtful comment, have a discussion, um, upload your own photos, your own responses. Try to produce or create as much as you consume and have that balance. And the best way to do that is to use your laptop. So this is why I never reply to emails from my phone. It's possible, which is nice. So in a pinch sometimes, an emergency, I will you know, send a short message. But if I'm gonna write an actual email or if I'm gonna sit down and do my batch emails, I'm never gonna do it from my phone. I'll always do it from a laptop. By PC, it could be a Mac as well, but from your, you know, your laptop or your computer. And while you're doing it, make sure that you're comfortable. Set up an ergonomic workplace. You know, have uh, the right table height, or have the right laptop height. And this even applies to when you are looking through Facebook or Twitter especially Facebook, is when you actually use a computer, you're gonna comment so much more. You're gonna write more thoughtful you know, comments. You're gonna interact more. Uh, when people, when someone sends you a message, you're gonna take the time and actually use good grammar. You're gonna punctuate, you're gonna you know, spell correctly. And then you're also gonna just write longer, better uh, messages and, and comments and posts. And this is really how you can balance the consuming and creating. You know. It doesn't have to be 50-50, but most people are, you know, 100% consumption and almost 0% creating. So some of my favorite tools that I use to do all this, uh, first, I like Momentum, which is a Chrome extension that allows you to write your to-do lists, write a daily focus of the day. 
last pass is a great passer and manager. Timeout is a screen locker where I set mine for 30 minutes, where every 30 minutes it completely locks my screen. So I have to take a two minute break, stand up, stretch, and do something else. Also, I install WhatsApp and iMessage apps for my laptop. And that allows me to get the messages either both on my phone and on my Mac. And it allows me to reply from my computer, which allows me to type better, longer, you know, more thoughtful uh, replies. And I'm a big fan of FaceTime and video chat if something's going to take more than three messages. The reason why I like having a Mac and like being in this OS is everything auto saves. And I think that was the one thing that turned me on the Mac because it just made so much sense when I was editing a video and instead of you know having to go and just remember to click save all the time, I actually was really flabbergasted the first time I used iMovie and there was no save button because it just auto saves all the time. And it made me realize all the papers that I've lost, that I spent hours writing, all the videos I've lost, you know, that I spent hours, you know, editing, all that could have been saved if Microsoft or whoever the, the producer was, was smart enough to just create autosave on everything. So this is why I like Mac, uh, but doesn't, you know, even if you use a PC or use something else, try to have everything sync, try to have everything autosave, try to have everything, you know, in an easy order where you don't have to manually go and do anything you know if you write something on your phone and your notepad you know you can use the normal notepad like i use or you can use evernote or whatever it is uh or you know you put you put in a an event in your calendar just have it all sync and that's why that way you can have everything everywhere and never have that have the stress of double booking yourself or forgetting an appointment so here's an example of my momentum dashboard. Every day I write down a goal. So today is make a thousand dollars and enjoy the day. You get a nice little quote. You get your a quick to-do list that you can check off as you write it down and you get a new nice photo every day. Uh, my calendar is pretty basic. This is just the standard Mac calendar, but I have my Gmail calendar sync with it. I have my business Gmail calendar sync with it. I have, you know, my phone's calendar uh, synced with it. So I always know what I'm doing and I can always check and just make sure I don't double book anything, I don't forget anything. So pretty easy, I just look at it in the morning and then uh, see what I have to do that day as well as take a quick look to see if there's anything I need to do the next morning uh, before I check it. <coughs> so some of my favorite products itself, uh, for productivity is my L Roost laptop stand. This is basically a portable stand that allows your laptop to go to eye level. And that way you're not bending your back, you're not gonna be uncomfortable and strained. Uh, the only downside of it is you have to use a an external keyboard and mouse, but it's worth it. I also use Bose noise canceling headphones, which allows you to work in busy places and not you know, have that extra stress, you know, be able to really silence out the world. It also works really well for your rest and relaxation if you're on a plane or a train or somewhere that's that's noisy. And as you can see, I wear glasses when I work. I don't actually need glasses, and that's why you never see me with contacts or glasses, but the anti-glare alone makes it so I can work a lot longer without my eyes getting tired. It just gets rid of that eye strain. And also turns out that even though one of my eyes is perfect as 2020, the other one's not you know, quite perfect, which means one eye is working slightly harder than the other, and this just balances it out. So I'm able to work, you know, eight, 10, 12, 14 hours a day and stare at a laptop without getting too tired, uh, which would happen if I didn't have the glasses. So highly recommend looking into that. And when it comes down to it, when I have a good exercise and fitness routine and I'm in shape, I'm just more productive. So when I was first starting my businesses, every day at 4 p.m., I would have an alarm and I would say, you know what, go to the gym. And if I didn't do it, I would just feel like if I like had so much work to do, sometimes I would try, I would skip it and I would have terrible productivity that day and the next. And that's why it's such an important uh, thing to have is your exercise and fitness routine. Uh, and what else is, the other thing that's helped me a lot with mental clarity has been, being on a low or no carb diet 
and drinking bulletproof coffee with MCT oil. So here is when I was in the best shape of my life is when I was you know, drinking bulletproof coffee, I was doing CrossFit, and I was eating a very low carb paleo diet. And unfortunately, I haven't been back on that. But at the same time, my productivity hasn't been as high as when I was on it either. So there's definitely direct correlation between me, you know, having the the fitness and diet routine and me being super productive. So even though there's a lot of downsides of CrossFit, it's not a you know, it's not perfect. The paleo diet is not perfect. The bulletproof diet is not perfect. For productivity wise, if you don't think about anything else. I was, I had so much energy. I was never tired. And more importantly, I had so much mental clarity. I was able to really, you know, uh, just push through and create huge businesses during that time and really crush it and work hard. So uh, if you haven't, you know, heard the whole story, you can read my book, Life Changes Quick. And that's where I talk about this whole journey of goal setting, getting into the diet, you know, getting to the best shape of my life and building all these great businesses. So whatever you end up doing, you want to be able to work on your schedule. You want to be able to work how you like, where you like. And the way to do that is to follow these three rules of success. The first is to be as productive as possible when you actually work. Just because you go to you know the cafe and open your laptop or you say you work eight hours a day, it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're not productive. So this is where being productive actually matters. And you got to work hard, you know, especially those first two or three, four months during growth mode. If you don't work your ass off during that time, nothing else matters. You know, if you aren't putting in the struggle, putting in the work, you can't relax and sip on on a coconut on the beach. And I think the biggest problem with the lifestyle of the digital nomad is it's not sexy to show photos of us just at the, you know, co-working space every day for three months. So we might take one photo, but people assume we're not really working and that we're just on vacation all the time. And that's not true. We work our butts off so we can go on vacation and we can enjoy life. But it is important also to enjoy life, relax, travel, and recharge again so we can do it all over. So those are the three rules. These are some of the resources that I mentioned. Uh, the Travel Like a Boss podcast, the Invest Like a Boss podcast, my first book, which is about you know scuba diving and living cheaply in Thailand called 12 Weeks in Thailand. The second book, which is about fitness, goal setting, and making the first 30K. Life changes quick. Uh, I have links to my Udemy courses, my Income Boss course that teaches affiliate marketing and monetizing blogs and things like that. And also, I have a link to a blog post I wrote called My Daily Routine for Success because I think a lot of people are going to be curious about what I actually do day to day. If you want to download these slides and have access to all these links, just go to dropshiplab.com slash timehack. I'll have it in the description as well. Uh, that way you can just click there, download the slides or find what you need. And I'll see you uh, at johnnyft.com. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below and I'm happy to help. Whatever you end up doing with your business, I wish you the best of luck uh, and the most success because it is worth it. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Namaste. Namaste. What do you want to say? Yeah. Say, say something else? Yeah. Besides yeah? Do you want to say more? Yeah. Okay. Namaskar? Yeah? Namaskar? Namaste. Namaskar. Yeah. India? Yeah. India? Yeah. This is India? Yeah, no India. No India? Where no, are we? No. Yeah, Kathmandu. What, what country? Yeah. China? China? No. Korea? No. Where are, where are we now? Yeah. Nepal? Yeah, Nepal. Can't man do Nepal. Yeah.